Well, good morning, New Life. Welcome to church this morning. So glad that you're here hanging out with us. Hey, if you're watching online today, I would love to know that you're here. Be sure to comment. Let us know, you know, where you're at, what you're doing this summer. Let us know how we can be praying for you also. We love praying for the needs of the church and we just want to connect with you uh, online, wherever you're watching today. This morning, what I want to do for a few minutes is talk to you through the book of Genesis. So if you got a Bible, or Bible app, or if you want to follow along with us on the Bible app, you can do that. I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 1. I'm going to kind of read through it. I may take some breaks. I may skip around a little bit, but for the most part, you can follow me. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 11. Let's get into it. This is what it says. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say that you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, the woman said. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat from. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it or you will surely die. Now, if you know this story, you kind of get where I'm going at right now. Maybe you've heard this story a thousand times. And I just want to pause for just a second in this moment and say that it had nothing to do with the tree. If you know the story of Adam and Eve, then you know what's coming next. And you know it's because she chose to take from that tree that the fall of humanity happened. But it really had nothing to do with the tree. The tree wasn't magic. It didn't have magical superpowers or anything like that. It was more about a relationship thing. It was Adam and Eve having a relationship with God. It was a trust thing between God and humanity. And in that moment, it wasn't that this tree had magical powers, but rather that there was broken trust involved. So we move on to verse seven, and this is what it says. After they had taken from the tree, verse seven says this, at that moment, their eyes were opened and suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he replied, I heard you walking in the garden. So I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. And then the Lord asked this, who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you were naked? I want to title my message this morning. Who told you that? Let's pray together. God, we love you so much. Thank you for being in this place today. Thank you for every person watching right now online. Thankful for every person, God. I pray that this message not come from me or my mind, but it comes straight from you, that we take something from it today. We apply it to our lives. God, we thank you so much in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, If you're watching online right now, real quick, in the chat, I want to know how many of you have ever been lied to? If you've, if you've ever been lied to, just give me a thumbs up in the chat right now. How many of you have ever been lied to? I think most of us would agree that it's hardly ever fun to get lied to. The, uh, we have a saying in my family that the only time it's a good time to lie is around Christmas time, <laughs> okay? And that seems kind of funny, but like we're brutal with our Christmas gifts. Like my, my parents, when I was a kid, they would, use, they, would, they would package things in giant gift boxes, okay? Boxes as tall as me, and the item I would get in that box would be about this big. Like we were brutal in trickery and deceit when it came to Christmas time, but usually... Lying is never a good thing. And this morning, I want to talk about lying, but not in how we need to tame our own tongue, but rather the things that we hear and believe in. And I want to show you a quick video of something that uh, I saw a a few years ago. It was a video from Payless Shoe Stores. I think they're out of business now, but back in the day, they used to be known for their discounted shoes and reasonable prices. And they were very proud of the fact that they have very low and competitive prices. And so this is a video. It's an actual video of something they did. Check it out. The experiment making headlines by the chain Payless Shoes. They held a grand opening of a luxury store with a different name but the same shoes and charged hundreds more for those same shoes. Customers paid. Here's ABC's Kana Whitworth. Behold, Palessi. We built a fake luxury store in Los Angeles and filled it with Payless Shoes. The guests at our grand opening party had no idea. Guests invited to check out what looked like a luxury shoe shop. They're elegant, sophisticated. I just think it's so classy. And I could tell it was made with high quality material. A $35 shoe going for $645. 
an 1,800% markup. Store owners sat on their heels as fashion influencers emptied their wallets. I would pay 400, 500, yeah. People are gonna be like, oh, where'd you get those? Those are amazing. Then they're let in on the prank. These are actually from Payless. You've got to be kidding me. Shut up. Are you serious? David Payless calling it a provocative social experiment designed to challenge today's image conscious culture. Either way, it was an effective PR stunt. Yeah. David. Clearly a marketing ploy, but they paid. Kana, thank you. Can you believe that? That is amazing. The, the, the thing that stood out to me the most in that video is what the man said at the very end. They paid. Like, this was something that they went into thinking they were so sophisticated, great quality, all these things. These $30 shoes end up going for over $600, and yet still they paid. They took the bait. They bought the lie. They paid way more than they should have. The truth is this. Nobody ever wakes up ready to believe a lie. You don't wake up expecting to say, hey, I'm going to get fooled today. I can't wait to be deceived. No, it usually happens to us slowly and without warning. I heard someone say recently on a podcast that nobody knows that they've been deceived until after they've been deceived. It's the belief in what they're doing is actually true that makes the deceit work. And it's in incredibly accurate. We don't, we don't expect to be deceived until after we've been deceived. Us believing in the lie causes it to become true for us. And it's not until our eyes are opened afterwards that the reality sinks in. And so the question is this morning, what lies have we been told that we're buying into? Because the truth is what you do with a lie today will determine where you stand tomorrow. What you do with a lie that is told to you today determines where you stand tomorrow. See, the enemy, Satan is smarter than sometimes we give him credit for. We often know that the enemy has been defeated. God has defeated the enemy, but yet we forget that the enemy can still trick us if we're not careful. See, Satan knows, he's smart enough to know he can't defeat God, but he can get to you. And if we're not careful, if we let our guard down, we can easily be swayed into the things of the enemy. Satan is not going after God, he's going after you. Believe it or not, a few years ago, we actually had a church softball team here. That seems like a really hard 180, but I got a point. Give me just a second. We used to actually have a church softball team here. And if you've ever been a part of church softball, you know it's not always very Christian-like. And for some reason, I still don't know how this happened. I got roped into being the coach of our church softball team. And so we would go out there. Now, these teams were usually made up of, you know, people in their late 20s, 30s, and early 40s. And we were all out there. It was a co-ed team. So you had guys and girls out there, all positions playing. And there were moments it was a lot of fun. There was also moments it got very competitive very quickly. And if you've ever been part of a team sport, you know that you're going to do whatever you can do to, within the rules to try and win. And so this is, a, this is a group of people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And any time one of these middle-aged dads would slide into second and tweak an ankle, we made a note of it. Why? because we knew when they took the field where they were playing. And if this guy had, who had tweaked his ankle was playing out in right field, you better believe I told our batters, hey, if you can, make sure you hit it to right field. He's got a bum ankle and he's not gonna be able to run very fast. And so you might be able to get a hit on him. Why did I do that? Because I knew that if we could attack where the weakness was, we had a better opportunity at winning the game. The enemy wants to do the same thing to us. He wants to attack us where we are the weakest. He wants to find the areas in our lives that we are weak in. He wants to find the areas in our lives that we struggle in. He wants to find the areas in our lives that he can attack and maybe just maybe take us down. You guys have heard the analogy about a thousand times that when you watch a National Geographic or Discovery Channel and you see the herd of gazelles and the one lion, the lion's not going after the herd, he's going after the straggler. The enemy wants to do the same thing to, to us. If he can attack us where we're weakest, he has a better chance at winning. So this morning, I wanna talk us through three lies that the enemy will often tell us. Lies that make God come up to us and talk to us and go, who told you that? Who told you that was true? 
So this morning, lie number one, who told you that your life is all about you? Who told you that your life was all about you? When the serpent came to Eve, he told her that the only reason God said not to eat it is because God doesn't want you to know everything that he does. The enemy had put the, the, the focus directly on Adam and Eve, put it on them, made them part of the story, told them that everything is about you and why can't you get what you want? The enemy began to attack their pride. Pride is all about us. It's about saying that we can do what we want and that we are in control of our own narrative and we're in control of our own story. For years, some of you may remember this, Burger King's motto was, have it your way. And that may be really good for a burger fast food chain, but it's no way to live our lives. First Corinthians, Chapter six, verse 20 says this. Didn't you realize that your body is a sacred place, the place of the Holy Spirit? Don't you see that you can't live however you please, squandering what God paid such a high price for? The physical part of you is not some piece of property belonging to the spiritual part of you. God owns the whole thing. Another translation says, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. It goes on to say, so let people see God in and through you. Paul is teaching in this moment about sexual purity and how to respect our bodies, but the application can be taught through every aspect of our lives. We are bought with a price and Jesus paid it. The life that you live right now, it's not your own. It doesn't belong to you. It's on lease. It is borrowed from God himself. God owns it. We just get to borrow it. Remember the line that stood out to me in that Payless video a little bit earlier? They paid. Here's the thing. We don't have to pay at all. Jesus paid the ultimate price for us on the cross. It's like this. It's like borrowing something from a friend of yours. When you borrow a TV for for a game day or you borrow somebody's car or a lawnmower or whatever it may be, you know it's not yours. You've been allowed to borrow it, treat it maybe as if it is yours, but you know you don't own it. They paid for it, you just get to use it. But you better believe if I break that lawnmower, I'm gonna have to buy them a new one. I'm gonna have to pay and take care of it. Same thing kind of goes with our spiritual lives. Jesus already paid the price. What we have is not our own, but yet if we do not take care of what we do have, we end up paying in the long run. Jesus already paid for it. But if we don't take care of what's been given, then we end up paying for it. There's a great quote I saw this week from Charles Spurgeon. This is what it says. Your body was a willing horse when it was in the service of the devil. Let it not be a sluggish hack that now draws the chariot of Christ. Craig, that's a lot of old time language. What what are you trying to get at? What he's trying to say here is that when you were not with Christ, when you were just kind of doing your own thing, you went headstrong into whatever decisions you made. But so often, now that we've become part of the body of Christ, we become timid. We become sluggish. We become scared maybe to step out. Yet now that we're following Christ, we are carrying the most valuable possession of all. Let's go boldly in our faith. Let's take a step out and tell somebody our story. Let's live our life like it's not our own and give back to the creator. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus says that the greatest commandment is to A, love God and B, love people. It does not say love yourself first, then take care of God and other people. We don't crack the top two. God is saying, love me first, then I want you, whatever you have left, I want you to give it away and take care of other people. God first, than other people. Our lives are not our own. Lie number two from the enemy. Who told you to follow your heart? Who told you to follow your heart? I don't know if you realize this or not, but comic strips still exist, but they're not found on newspapers anymore, the old black and whites. They're found on Instagram and you can follow comic strips on Instagram and comics. They're, they're, they're a lot of fun. One of my favorites to follow on Instagram is one called Heart Versus Brain. And uh, it's a great comic strip. This is what it looks like. This is what it says. The brain is saying, I'm worried about our financial situation. And then the heart says, well, then let's buy some re- something really cool to take your mind off of the stress. 
It's really funny, but it's a really great illustration of what sometimes our heart will do to our brain. Our heart will get us into trouble. I saw a quote last week that says, follow your heart, but take your brain with you. Like our heart, our emotions, our feelings can get us in trouble. It makes us want to do spur of the moment things. It makes us want to do and make bad decisions. Sometimes we need our brain to step in and put a stop to something and to put the feelings aside and make logical choices. In the same way, sometimes we need to dig deeper into our soul and consult the Holy Spirit on the things that we're going through. Our emotions are a powerful, powerful thing. It's why just the smell of nutmeg or apple cider will send you back to your grandma's kitchen at the age of 12 baking cookies around Christmas time. It's the reason that you can hear a song like, oh, I'm halfway there. Yeah, some of y'all are already singing it right now, uh, watching at home. It's the reason we can hear living on a prayer and immediately we can, we can almost smell cassette tapes and VHS tapes and Old Spice, right? We can get transported back in time just by hearing a song. It's an emotional connection. Our emotions pull us in, but look at what it says in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse nine. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? That is a heavy verse, a heavy statement that the heart is deceitful above all else. And it's beyond cure. There's nothing that we can do to adjust or fix our emotions and our heart. But we do have the choice whether or not to be led by it or not. Our heart will lie to us. Emotions are temporary. Feelings are fleeting. And this is why Satan knew that he could convince Eve to take a bite of the fruit. He had already gotten to her pride. He had already made her think that this whole narrative was about her. Now all he had to do was start to push her in the emotional direction. He tapped into her emotions. And this is what it says in in verse six. It says that she thought it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree that was desirable to make one wise. And so she took of its fruit and ate. It was no longer about trying to convince her mind. It was about connecting to her emotions, leading her by her heart. One of my favorite Old Testament stories is found in 1 Kings chapter 19. And it's the story of Elijah. He's trying to hear from God and he experiences some emotional moments in that cave. He experiences and sees fire. He feels an earthquake and he can hear the wind, but God isn't found in any of those things. What he's found in is just a still, small voice. He's found in the still, he was not found in the emotionally driven, the emotionally charged things that he experienced, but it was that consistent voice that he had always heard. That's where he found God. Finding God is not in the show. It's not in the emotional feelings and moments, but rather in the stillness, in the consistency that we find God. Finally, lie number three. Who told you that it always has to be this way? Who told you that it always has to be this way? I think this is one of those lies. You know, the the whole reason Adam and Eve, I believe, felt shame after their sin is they realized they had broken something. I don't know if you've ever broken. I actually last night broke something here at the church. I was handing a coffee mug to one of our interns and it slipped out of my hands, hit the ground and shattered into a whole bunch of pieces. And it was that moment, I was like, oh no, there's nothing I can do to repair that. Anytime something is broken, you immediately realize, I don't think it's ever gonna be the way it was. There's no way I can can recover from this. It's just gonna always be broken. But the beautiful thing about God is found in redemption. It's the whole purpose of the gospel. Jesus coming to earth to redeem mankind. It's the reason why Jesus came. And we see proof of that in this story. Well, Craig, hold up. I've heard Adam and Eve's story a few times. Where is the redemption? Like they they take from the fruit, they sin, they hide from God, God finds them, then he banishes them out of Eden. Adam now has to toil the ground. Eve now has to deal with the pains of child. Where is the redemptive quality in this story? Here's where it is. Did you realize that Eve was never called by name until after the fall. 
She was never given a name. She was always referred to as the woman or a helper. She was never referred to by name. It wasn't until after her mistake, after the brokenness, that she was given a name. This is what it says, Genesis chapter three, verse 20. Then the man Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. This is the amazing thing about God is that even after our mistakes, even after our mess ups, even after our brokenness, even when we think, we hear that lie from the enemy that it's always gonna be this way, you're always going to be considered the one who ruined the world. Even after all that, God still gave Eve a name, an identity, and a purpose. Here's a big point I want you to walk away with, that God will use your mess to create something amazing. God will take your mistake and through a little Jesus magic, turn it into something incredibly amazing. He will take your story to be used by more people, to impact people, to tell people about God's goodness. Eve's faithfulness in bearing children, Cain, Abel, Seth, because of her faithfulness in that, 76 generations later from Eve, we get Jesus on the scene. And then Jesus comes to redeem mankind. It's an incredible turnaround. It's an incredible testament to who God is and what he wants to do. He can make something amazing happen from you. He can give you an identity. He can give you a purpose. So if you fall for the lie, yes, there will probably be consequences for it. The people in the Payless commercial, right? They paid, they paid, they paid that money, consequence. And yes, if you fall for the lie, it may result in things being different. It may not be the same as it once was. And it may result in hard circumstances. But God can use you despite your mess up. God can use you for a purpose and a calling that can be beyond anything you can imagine right now. God wants to use you. God loves using broken and messed up people. Ephesians 2.10 says this, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The enemy loves to take a moment or situation where there is real pain, where there's real hurt, where there's a real struggle and he will introduce something contrary to the truth. He wants to attack you when you're at your most vulnerable. So what do we do? What can we do? We need to identify what the lie is. We need to be on the lookout, be aware of what these lies are. And then we have to know what the truth is counter to the lie. We do both of these things by simply knowing who God is, by having a relationship with God, by knowing him. Isaiah 55, three says this, come to me with your ears wide open, listen, and you will find me. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. Don't listen to the lies that come at you. If you're hearing something that's contrary to the word of God, then it's a lie. If you're hearing something that goes against and, and maybe seems counteractive or doesn't quite mesh with what scripture says and what God is speaking to you, then it's a lie. We can't get so caught up in the lies of the enemy that we lose sight of who God is. When you silence the noise around you, God's voice can become clear. If you're just like Elijah and you silence everything around you, if you get past the emotion, get past those moments, get past the chaos, get past everything else, Listen to the small voice of God. Listen to what God wants to speak to you because only the voice of God can show you the voice of truth. Let me pray. God, I love you. Thank you for your word today, God. We thank you that we don't have to, to fall into the traps of the enemy. We don't have to fall into and get sucked into the lie. We don't have to pay an outrageous price for something you've already paid for. God, teach us that our life is not our own, that it is borrowed, that we, we are here to live for you. 
Teach us not to follow our heart and get sucked in by every emotion that we feel, but use discernment to use the Holy Spirit as a guide to help us through difficult circumstances. God, teach us that even though we are broken, we don't always have to stay this way. It doesn't always have to be this way, that you provide a way out for us. You wanna give us a purpose and an identity. We thank you for that today, Jesus. In your name, amen. Listen, if you're watching this this morning and we wanna celebrate with you, let us know in the comments. Uh, you can send us a, a prayer request by texting Cersei to 88,000. We'd love to connect with you some way, okay? Let's go back into worship this morning. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battles for you have never failed me yet. Your promise, your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never. You're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Oh, yes, it will. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness.